The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. I'm thinking of taking a year off university next year, and I'd like to travel around Europe. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Good morning. How can I help you? I'm thinking of taking a year off university next year and I'd like to travel around Europe. OK, then. Do you have any idea where you'd like to go? Well, I was thinking of starting in France and then working my way up to Eastern Europe, possibly going as far as Slovakia. Well, there are a number of ways you can do this, and we have various options available. It really depends on your budget and how you'd like to travel. That's just the thing, really. Um, I mean, I've just finished my second year at university, so obviously I'd like to do it in as cheap a way as possible. That's fine. Could you give me a rough idea of the price range you're looking at? Realistically speaking, I'm hoping to pay between about £700 and £900. Pounds. I could stretch to £1,100, pounds, but that's really my limit. How long are you thinking of going for? About 10 months. To be honest, you'd be better off travelling for about 7 months, if that's your budget. OK, that's not too bad. So, how would you suggest I travel? Well, because of the time limit, I don't think walking is a viable option. Of course, in this day and age, the most convenient way to get around is by flying, particularly if you've got quite a bit you want to see in a short space of time. Saying that, I still think the best way to get around Europe is by train. As a student, you can also get a student rail card, which means cheap affairs. That sounds brilliant. How do I go about getting a rail card? Well, if you decide that's what you want to do, then we can organise that all for you. You'll need to fill in a form and provide us with two passport photos, mm -hmm. and we'll do the rest. It costs about £36 plus about £10 administration costs. Great. That's really not expensive at all. And what about buses? I was just thinking if I decide to go to places which are a bit more remote... There are always local buses, but these are not always a good idea. They can be quite unreliable and in some areas quite dangerous because the buses tend to be overcrowded and some of the drivers drive way too fast. So I would suggest you don't do this. That sounds quite frightening. So what are my options then? You could hire a car, but it can be expensive. Still... I do think if you're thinking about going to smaller towns and places which are off the beaten track, then hiring a car is by far the better way to do it. You can also look at sharing the costs by hiring a car with someone else. That's a good idea. I guess I could put a message on the internet. You could do that. But don't forget that you meet people when you're travelling and you'll probably find someone who's going to the same place as you are. That's true. I want to stay in youth hostels, so I'm sure I'll find people who are interested in going to the same places. Oh, one last thing. What about taxis? I was thinking about if I go out at night. I use taxis all the time here. Oh, but taxis abroad are a different story. In certain countries, they're no problem, but by and large, taxi fares are high. Oh. If you do go out at night, try walking home, but make sure you don't do this alone. Try and find people to go out with at night or come home at a reasonable time. But if you're staying in youth hostels, you should find plenty of young people to go out with at night. I'm sure I will. Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10.
now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Now, have you thought about how you'd like to travel to France? Not really, no. There are basically three ways. You can go by ferry, which leaves every day and night, or there's the hovercraft, which is more pricey, but will get you there quicker, and, of course, you could fly. Well, I don't think flying is an option for me, as it'll be too expensive. So I suppose I'll choose one of the other two. It's a pity, really, as I don't fancy the idea of travelling by sea. Last time I did that, I got terribly seasick. <laughs> well, you're in luck then, as at the moment there's a special deal on flights to France. Ah. In fact, a plane ticket is now half the price of a ferry ticket, which is usually the cheapest option. That's great. I'll do that then. I much prefer flying anyway. I'll need to get some details off you then. Firstly, how will you be paying? Cash, cheque or credit card? If you pay by cheque, you'll need a cheque guarantee card. I don't have my cheque book with me, so it'll have to be by credit card. Fine, that's no problem. If you could just sign over here, and then we'll have a look at flight times, and I can sort out a youth travel card for you. Fine. Oh, can I use your pen, please? No problem. Now, let's look at times. There is a flight leaving at 9am, and one that leaves half an hour later... Or you can choose a later flight at 11.30. No, I think 11.30 is too late, so I think I'd prefer the flight that leaves after 9. I'm not very good at getting up in the morning. <laughs> no problem. Just give me a moment. Right, that's booked for you. Please remember that if you want to change this, you must give 24 hours notice or you will lose your place. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between a student and an accommodation officer. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Well, you have left things a bit late. Have you tried looking for somewhere in Newbridge? Newbridge? No, I haven't. I've never heard of Newbridge. Well, let me show you. I've got a map here. Here's where everything is. You come into Newbridge over the bridge, and the main road in front of you is, surprisingly enough, the High Street. This is one of the main streets. Hmm... And branching off to the left, you can see there, is West Street. That is another busy part of town. I see. Now, as I was saying, here is the High Street and here is West Street going left. Now, if you go along West Street, the first place you come to on your right is the supermarket. It's not a very big one, but it's got most things you're likely to need. Next to it... There's the old town hall. I say the old town hall because it is about a 100 years old, but it will soon make way for a car park, I'm afraid. I suppose the car is king. Now, opposite the supermarket is the railway station. You can get very frequent buses and trains from here into the university. And next to that is the sports centre. It's a brand new one and was built on the site of some tennis courts. So that's progress. Huh. It's got everything the keen sportsman like yourself might require. 
Now that's the centre of town, and I want to point out to you the buildings opposite the supermarket, but on the other side of London Road. There are two buildings there. The one further away from the High Street is called the Heights, and the one nearer the High Street is called the Towers. What are they? They are where you could find a flat. One of them, the Heights, has a number of flats for rent at the moment. Oh, good. Look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now the first one is flat four. That's a nice flat with a balcony, and you need to apply to the Newbridge Accommodation Agency to ask about that one. You'll find their number in the phone book. Number six is another nice one which has been empty for a while, and you can ring the owner directly. I think. Yes, I've got her number written here. There it is. Right, thank you. Good. Now, number eight is a re-advertisement. Ah,、uh, what do you mean? Well, it did have a tenant, but now it is for rent again. So I'd like to ask about that one. Leave it with me, and I'll look into it for you. Then we can talk about it when I've got more information. Okay. Are there others in this block? Yes. There's number ten. Now this one's a bit strange. It's advertised with an agency as well as privately in the local paper. Normally, if it's advertised through an agency, you shouldn't really go behind the agency and go directly to the owner. But on this occasion, I suggest you just answer the advert here in the newspaper, which the owner has obviously put in. Okay. Finally, there is number fourteen. This is with the New Start Agency. This is an agency started by the girl who was my assistant here, and she left to make money for herself. So she's not my favourite person, but I'm afraid I would have to advise you to go through the agency anyway. Again, their number is in the phone book. All right, is that something for you to be starting with? That's great,、uh, but、uh, what kind of place is Newbridge? It's a nice place. It was developed about a hundred years ago, really for people who worked in the factories around there. They were clothing factories, and everyone worked in them—men, women, boys, and girls. Then, when the factories closed down, things got very difficult for the town. There was a huge amount of unemployment until a few years ago, when, in the telecoms boom, a company making mobile phones started up. I think your phone was made in Newbridge, and now this company employs most of the people in the town. There are new housing estates on the edge of the town, but they're mostly occupied by young families, and there isn't much student accommodation there. Most flats and so on are in the centre. That sounds good. Well, let me know how you get on. Yes, of course.、Uh, thank you. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Ramil and Kirsten, discussing presenting a paper at an architecture conference. You now have thirty seconds to read questions twenty-one to twenty-eight.
Hi, Kirsten. Have you heard about that architecture conference in Oxford at the end of the year? Yeah, I saw the leaflet on the notice board. As it's my final year, I ought to try giving a paper, but I've got no idea how to go about it.、Oh, I think you should go for it. <sighs> I did one last year. It's quite straightforward. First of all, you need to see what the conference themes are. You know what topics they are covering.、Mm. You can do that by looking it up on the website. You need to submit a paper that falls into one of the categories they give you. Oh, that may give me some ideas. Then, while you're doing that, you should also have a look at the information on how to submit your paper,、mm. the rules, if you like, such as the length. It's important you follow those. I see. And then I suppose the next stage is to start writing it up.、Mm-hmm. I'd like to use it as an opportunity to propose some future work, but I understand it must be based on current work. Still, there's plenty to choose from. It makes sense to do something that I'm more familiar with. Yes, and the other thing is, when you've written it up, then go back and look at your data carefully. And make certain that you've presented it in a format that is standard for your subject.、Uh, Remember, people have to absorb information very quickly while they're listening. Don't make it too complicated. Okay. Well, I reckon that'll take me about a month to get that sorted. Then the next thing I have to do, I guess, before I send it off to the conference organizer, is give the whole thing to the events officer. So that he can look through it and see if it all makes sense and is okay. Yeah, remember to warn him that it's en route, so he can fit it into his schedule. Oh. Then you're done, really. All you have to do after that is to go through it and sort out any changes you need to make. Then finally, you can submit it. You can do that online. Phew. Good. Then I just wait to hear, I suppose. How long does that take? Mm, it depends, but usually about six weeks.、Oh. When you hear if your paper has been accepted, then at that stage, it's worth giving them a list of any technical things you need when you actually give the talk,、mm-hmm. a screen or video players or that sort of thing. Okay, but that's a long way off.、Mm. <laughs> And I know that if my paper is accepted, then at that stage I have to give them a short text about myself and my academic background, so that they can put it in the brochure. <sighs> Famous at last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You now have fifteen seconds to read questions twenty-nine to thirty. Right. Well, I've got to get a couple of things sorted if I'm going to get this paper completed. Have you got enough data? Possibly. I'd like to reinforce some of it, though. So, I thought I'd send out some more questionnaires. I was looking at that thesis that Angela wrote last year, and she said you need a sample of over a hundred to be sure of your results. I think some of this year's postgraduates are doing some of the same stuff as you on buildings. Why don't you talk to them?、Uh, I'll end up getting confused. It would be more useful for me to actually go out to that site by the rail bridge to see how they're building the new factory. Oh! I managed to get hold of Professor Barnett at London University, and he said I should go out and take pictures. I'm pretty busy, but I'll have to make time. Anyway, what about you? What are your That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. 
you'll hear a lecturer talking to students about sport in Ireland. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Now today we're going to be finding out about the most popular sports in the Emerald Isle. That's Ireland, of course. Can you guess what they are? Well, there are these two lesser played games, a form of rounders and Gaelic handball. But we'll start with one which is perhaps over 3,000 years old arriving in Ireland with the Celts, some claim. That may be a slight exaggeration, but I consider it to be the fastest field game in the world, and it goes by the name of hurling. Well, that's what it's known as in the English-speaking world anyway. So, what do you have to do? You've got 15 players on a team, one of them the goalkeeper. Each one has a stick called a hurley. Here you are. I've brought mine along. Had it since I was at school. This is what it looks like, and basically you have to get this ball, called a schlitter, that's S-L-I-O-T-A-R, so it's not spelt the way it's pronounced. You hit it into the net for three points, or you can hit it over the net for one point. The goal looks like the letter H, with the net under the crossbar. The goalie has a bigger stick than the others to help keep the ball out. You can also catch the schlitter and run with it for four steps maximum or bounce it on your stick. Is that clear to you all? I'll be showing you a video a bit later so you can see what a game actually looks like. You might like to think of it as a mixture of lacrosse, hockey and baseball. Oh, and it's played by women too but it goes by the name of Kamogi in that case. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. I'll give you a bit of the history, shall I now? Generally, the golden age of the game is considered to be the 18th century. But systematic rules were first agreed and drawn up at that great shrine of learning, Trinity College Dublin, in 1879, founding the Irish Hurling Union closely followed just a few years later by the formation of the Gaelic Athletics Association. With greater organisation last century, the All-Ireland Hurling Championship got off to a flying start, and I'm proud to say that my own native city of Cork has won more than 20 titles over the years. But then, so have Kilkenny and Tipperary. Is it only played in Ireland? No. Well, it is the only country with a national team at the moment, but you may be surprised to discover there are hurling clubs in London, as well as in America and Argentina, to name just a few. The other game I'd like to take a little time to introduce you to is Gaelic football, which is played on the same pitch as hurling with the same number of players, but there's no net. You just have to get the ball over your opponent's goalposts. And you can do that by kicking or punching the ball. However, you're not supposed to do that to the players, I might add. Imagine it as a combination of soccer and basketball. But in my opinion, it's a more exciting spectacle than either of those. Excuse my bias, if you will. It's also very popular with women. In fact, there are more women's teams than for any other sport whether despite or because of the physical contact involved, I wouldn't like to say. 
They do play a shorter game, 60 minutes, rather than the men's 70. So, let's have a look. If we can have the lights down, I'll see if I can get this technology to work. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.